Uh, please welcome to the stage Professor Martin Libicki. He holds uh, now the chair of uh, Kaiser Cybersecurity, chair of Cybersecurity Studies at the U.S. Naval Academy. But uh, for for me and for many other uh, people on the field, he has been uh, at the cutting edge of this topic for well over 20 years, writing about information warfare and uh, things related to that. Uh, he continues to research information technology, national security. Among his latest works are. Uh, uh, cyberspace in peace and war, and uh, conquest in cyberspace, national security, information, warfare. Let's all welcome Professor Libiki to the stage. Do we want this up? Um, mm -hmm. no? I'm just going to speak from notes. Also, thank you for reminding me how old I've become. <laughs> uh, the previous speakers passed the baton to future speakers on. Um, how to solve these problems. Unfortunately, I'm just going to add to more problems. Can you folks hear me in the back? Because I'm not very close to the microphone. OK, if you can't hear what I'm saying, raise your hand. That's paradox. Um, can you see them? Can I see them? Yeah, actually, I can. The light is not so bad there. I want to start off on, uh, on a basic paradox, OK? This is a cyber conference. Cyber is what makes your computer not work the way it's supposed to do, right? It doesn't work, it, it leaks information, it's wrong, etc. On the other hand, it's entirely possible to have fake news and your computer works perfectly correctly, right? So, so why, why do we have the two in the same place? Well, I've got three answers. There's a good answer. And the good answer is when you take a look at the tools of war and you're thinking, okay, I'm in a situation in which I want to do something to the other side and I don't want it to be lethal, and it doesn't have to be terribly predictable, but I'm very interested in ambiguity, and I'm very interested in persistence, you end up with a limited... They do? Yeah, I don't see any. <laughs> uh, are you, in fact, recording? <laughs> the age. Are we being recorded or not? Okay? And you're looking at a... Gra Always. <laughs> and you're looking at a grab bag of things you can do, well, it turns out it's a relatively small bucket, and it's got cyber in it, and it's got fake news and other forms of psychological operations, and it's got a few other things like electronic warfare in it as well. So in that sense, it belongs together. So that's the good reason. Bad reason is that the Russians do it, and they know what they're doing, so therefore it must all belong together. I'm going to talk about the third reason, which is the ugly reason. And the ugly reason is, if you think fake news is difficult when you talk about real-world events, Try thinking about fake news when you talk about cyber events, okay? And I'm going to start off in August 2014. This was several months after the United States had put, and the other Western countries had put sanctions on Russia for its activities in Crimea and the eastern Ukraine. And there was a report coming into the White House to the National Security Council that J.P. Morgan had been hacked. And the certainty was that the hack would, had taken place because of the Russians, that the Russians were sending a signal to the United States, that it was a shot across our bow, that was only a small example uh, of what the Russians could do if we really pressed down on the Russians, okay? Really effective signaling, strong use of the power of deterrence, only one problem. It weren't the Russians. It was actually folks from uh, Florida and Israel. Actually, it's not a bad combination, Florida and Israel, but I digress, okay? Uh, in fact, there have been other false flag uh, attacks in cyberspace. About that time period, many people, particularly in the national security community, became convinced that terrorists were really starting to achieve uh, a certain amount of strength in the business of cyber. Uh, they pointed to the TV5 attacks. They pointed to the Warsaw attacks. They pointed to the manipulation of U.S. CENTCOM's Twitter feed. Uh, and we had an awful combination of people who were good at cyber attacks and who were just totally evil, right? It's, a, it's always a bad combination. Only it wasn't ISIS. It turns out, in all likelihood, it was the GRU. And in fact, the GRU has kept up their mischief. There was a cyber attack against the Winter Olympics a few months ago, initially blamed on the North Koreans, who are not themselves nice guys, uh, but in, turn, in fact, it turned out most likely to be uh, the GRU. Okay. Sources of ambiguity. Why are we confused about what happens in cyberspace? Well, first fundamental things. What actually took place? Bear in mind, cyber attacks take place on systems, not all of whose manifestations are public. 
Now, that has good news and bad news. It, well, actually, it has strong effects and weak effects. One effect is you can hide a lot of, lot of cyber attacks. But that's the flip side, is, if, is that you can also fake a lot of cyber attacks at the same time. Okay? Oftentimes, we know that there's a cyber attack, but we don't know the impact. Uh, 18 years ago, there was something called the I Love You virus, and it was estimated, I've seen estimates in the media, that it cost the global economy $15 billion. And this was at a time when almost, no, when very, very few people actually had personal computers. Okay? Um, WannaCry. How much did WannaCry cost? I've seen estimates of $5 billion. I've seen estimates of $500 million. Uh, I've seen articles that have shown both estimates, and guess which number showed up in the headlines? Okay, no points if you actually get this, guess this one right. Okay? Attribution. Attribution is a huge unknown. Okay, who did it? Now, there was a lot of interesting discussion about attribution at a workshop, at a session we had yesterday. The consensus is attribution is getting better, and I believe that, but our ability to talk about attribution is not really getting better for a whole variety of reasons, okay? Is it easy to fake attribution? Yeah, it's not so hard to fake attribution if you want to. After all, if it's your system, you're the one, with all the, you're the one that owns all the indicators, right? Okay, last issue, and this relates to the J.P. Morgan thing. Even if you know what happened, it's not entirely clear why it happened, right? People who think that cyberspace is a precision medium and therefore you can do precision messaging in cyberspace uh, should actually take a look at the kind of messages that go along with the cyberspace event. In December 2015, Russians took down Ukraine's power supply. Several hundred thousand people lost power for several hours, okay? Why? What message was it trying to send? So here's four of them. One, there's a war on, okay? 1A, the Ukrainians had hurt uh, power supplies at a physical level going to Crimea by blowing up pylons. Not sure that's a true statement or not, but it got reported, okay? That's statement number one. Statement number two, this is the Russians trying to show how powerful they are by, by showing people what kind of damage they could do. Statement number three, the Russians didn't care what other people saw, they were just trying out their cyber attacks it's sort of uh, how you do operational test and evaluation if you're in the cyber world because you can't really go around attacking your own systems because it doesn't really prove anything. You have to attack other people's systems if you want to do operational test and evaluation. So that's reason number three. And reason number four, and I read this in Wired magazine, had something to do with privatization, but I still can't figure out exactly how it had anything to do with <laughs> privatization, okay? And that's only four. I bet you there are a lot of lot other messages that people tend to infer from, from these sorts of things. Again, fairly easy to manipulate. So, what are the possibilities? One is you can, in uh, some of what you do, say in cyber espionage, can result in the release of false documents. Now, if you, uh, two good examples, and I don't know why I keep coming back to the Russians here. You know, I just don't know why. Um, when uh, cyber espionage was carried out on the Soros Foundation, a number of concocted documents were in the pile. When uh, cyber, tax, cyber espionage was carried out on the World Anti-Doping Agency, a number of false documents were found in the file. Ironically, the Macron campaign figured out if you actually put false documents in the file, it actually inhibits that activity. Uh, okay, it seemed to work for him. Okay, you could take any cyber attack and blame it on people you don't like. Okay? In fact, you can cause your own cyber attack and blame it on people you don't like. And for those people who do not think that no co country would actually carry out an attack on its own people and blame, and blame the other, I've got an apartment block in Moscow I'd like to sell you, except I can't because it was blown up by, let's see, how do I do this, terrorists. Okay? Now, in this world things go wrong lots of times. So, why? Because computers are kind of finicky instruments. So why not blame hackers for that, right? Um, and by doing so, you create the impression that you need the government to safeguard your information. You create the impression you need the government to safeguard you from other. This is sort of like trick number one in the authoritarian handbook. Generate an enemy, blame things on the enemy, get your people to support you no matter what it is you do that makes them uncomfortable because you're going up against an enemy, okay? Uh, you further the narrative that the enemy is underhanded. 
Cyber espionage is almost always at some point a betrayal of trust. These are untrustworthy attackers, uh, all the more condemnable. Okay, what are the limits to this kind of mischief? There are two of them. One mischief is cyberspace actually has a lot of professionals working in it. By and large, most of the professionals, a large percentage of the professionals, are honest folk. They tend to call them as they see them. But there's one caveat, is you have to have honest professionals being allowed access to systems. And the terms on which they are allowed access to systems, it can often be, um, can often be strained. Okay? And if you're an authoritarian government, you have all the reason in the world not to let honest people, again, I'm going to use the air quotes, Look at your system to figure out what's, what's going on. Okay? So, yeah, there's going to be a lot of potential that fake news, when it's fake news about cyberspace, it has a lot going for it uh, in this world. Okay, conclusion. Uh, why is this so? Two basic reasons. One, cyberspace is inherently hard to understand. Um, and a lot of you have invested a lot of time and effort into understanding it. So you can imagine how poorly it's understood by people who haven't invested the time to understand it. And um, information about information warfare is itself an element of information warfare. So there's a, for you mathematicians, there's a reflexivity problem here. And by the way, if you're really good mathematicians, you know that if you can bend the reflexivity problem, you can prove 1 equals 0, and then you can prove anything. And on that proof, I will hand the baton to somebody else to go solve problems. <laughs> Thank you for a very enlightening presentation.